and when we can expect its definitive adoption by um, the EU. And if you believe, you know, if you could give us to, to uh, 2014, I believe it's to be uh, come into effect. But um, you know, that's a full 12 months. If you could give us a, a, a little bit more uh, specific details on on when exactly it is expected to be implemented. Um, the whole purpose of the European Union, we, we know, is to promote peace, its values and the well-being of its people. And in agreeing the EU 2020 strategy um, in, in 2010, EU member state governments specifically set themselves the task of reducing the numbers of poverty or at risk of poverty by at least 20 million, as you've said there, by 2020. Um, the fund uh, is very welcome in that it will replace the current food distribution programme. And, um, <coughs> I would welcome your views also on how the fund will it continue to achieve this task of reducing poverty and how effective it will be. Can I ask you also to outline your immediate tasks as Rapporteur over the coming months and how important uh, you believe engaging with the NGOs will be, specifically those who work with and on behalf of children living in, or people living in poverty, the homeless, children and indeed Minister Burton, the important role that she will play um, as the incoming chair of the Social Affairs Council. Uh, I read lately somewhere that you held a public information sem seminar in Dublin recently for the Irish NGOs interested in the new fund, which I think is very good because I think you need to get to the core, to the heart of it, to the people who are going to be involved. And I think that's essential for anything to be um, successful, you know, is that you do communicate. But I, I'd just like to ask, you know, how effective you found that seminar um, on, and, uh, on how successful that you, that you feel this was. Um, I mean, we know that in Ireland alone, over 300,000 people were suffering from severe material deprivation in 2010, which is very, very hard. Um, and I wonder if you could outline how Ireland, I mean, I know you talk there about it's, it's a European thing, but if you could maybe just elaborate on um, specifically on how Ireland can expect and how we can expect to see, to, to gain from this fund. Um, how difficult do you think um, it, will be, uh, it will be now to uh, meet the uh, imposed deadlines? You have referred briefly there to the opposition that uh, has been held by some of the, the countries. Um, I mean, I, I would personally agree that the measures like this fund are needed more than ever now as more and more people are slipping into the poverty trap as a result of the present economic <coughs> crisis. I will be very, very brief. Thank you. Um, and I agree with uh, Commish Commissioner Ander on his recent words when he said that the fund is an expression of Europe's solidarity with its most vulnerable citizens and provide them with the relief and hope for a better future. I wish continued success in working with all sides to ensure the success of this ambitious new EU initiative. Um, I realise I might be slightly more biased, um, slightly biased, but I've no doubt that you are indeed the right woman for the job. Um, briefly, I would just like to mention the proposed youth guarantee. This is something that I know I, I totally appreciate how hard you have worked, as you said yourself, it is one of the things that you've spoken most on since your appointment to um, the European Parliament. Um, the worrying figures reported yesterday of 27.7 um, percent of people under 25 um, uh, being unemployed is, is extremely worrying. And again, I know you've referred to how youth employ unemployment can affect the young, both in terms of um, the prospects when you're, when you're long-term unemployed and trying to get employment, and also from the health point of view. Particularly, I would worry about the mental health point of view of being um, unemployed for such a long time. Um, as a mother myself of three children in third level education, I certainly would welcome the youth guarantee and the guarantee that we will have some form of um, apprenticeship or further education or an offer of a job um, within four months. I think this is vital um, to ensure that, that, that they all have um, and that the youth guarantee is the best way to tackle employment. Could you elaborate? And I like the way I, I, you know, that it's going to be person-centred, um, that it will be, you know, rather than offering a course that's just out there. But um, uh, so I, I better leave it at that, Lasker Hart Kierlich. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Moran. Senator Zappone. 
You have five Mr. minutes. Mr. Gerlich, and um, welcome, uh, Deputy Costello. And though I don't have um, the filial bias of uh, Senator Moore in there, I would uh, also say, and and my colleague Senator Van Turnout agreed with me, that you certainly have hit the ground running. And it's really very, and I, we mean that most sincerely. And apologies, as she's already indicated to you, she's had to go back to her committee. Um, and, but I know she'll be in touch with you if, if she isn't able to come back to raise her own question. But uh, most impressed with the way that you've outlined already the work that you've taken on in such a strategic fashion and in a very comprehensive fashion. So thank you for that. Um, I, I have just a, a couple of remarks. First of all, I suppose that I am just so delighted to and so thrilled really to hear um, about your commitment to envision to what you call a binding social pact which is, is, is how you concluded your, your speech to us today, and um, the importance of identifying the objectives, perhaps even a regulatory and a monitoring framework in relation to that. I think that is absolutely crucial. Um, I suppose I've been uh, trying to identify the importance of that even you know, at, at, at the Irish level uh, because of obviously the all-consuming focus in relation to the economy, which to a certain degree maybe is necessary. But so I want to so welcome that, and if there's, and I know uh, Senator Van Turnout and perhaps other of our, other of my group would be very keen to, to know more from you, a little bit more about that, and also committed to work with you in relation to that at European level. Um, the second thing is again, uh, uh, as others, and again, just Senator Moran just mentioning your and welcoming your. Um, uh, appointment to be rapporteur of the European aid for the most deprived just just one of the and one of the things she already brought up particularly the importance of uh, the fund um, I think being implemented through that dialogue or shared management with NGOs as is um, and um, uh, and and public bodies as, as partner organizations but it reminded me of um, and I, I think you may have been present but many of us were present for uh, when um, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton Clinton gave her a public address in DCU there a number of months ago on um, the front line, the frontiers of, of hu a human rights approach. And, and one of the key kind of conclusions of that speech suggesting that really a, a human rights approach has to do with having a, a, a initiating a strategic dialogue with civil society in the context of the developing countries uh, where, where, where it's being operated. Uh, so it might be interesting to go back to that. But thirdly, um, and this is where my question lies, I suppose the whole notion of, and I welcome uh, your, your remarks and also obviously the remarks and the commitment of of, of Minister Burton in relation to the social investment um, of the package um, that, that, that's, that's being developed in, in a European context. And I guess I'm wondering, um, uh, you know, maybe in, in the context of, of what's currently going on, that that social investment largely means social protection. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking here of recently we've begun, the, the Shannon has begun our third public consultation, and our consultation this time is in relation to um, social change, social innovation, um, and we had a number of groups before us, uh, Change Nation, Ashoka, Social Entrepreneurship, uh, presenting to us their views. And in that context, I understand that there has been some um, lobbying, encouragement for the development of a social social innovation fund in the context of the, um, uh, the, the, the European budget. And I'm wondering if you would be um, uh, aware of, has there been any movement in relation to that? I think you'd, be, you'd, you'd know that the European Union has recognized the significance of social innovation, um, uh, the social innovation sector with entrepreneurship, which identified by the Commission as one of the 12 levers that will boost growth, strength, confidence and revitalize the single market and clearly um, I think we would, would we would be able to conclude as a Shannon having listened to the evidence of those incredible organizations operating here in Ireland and actually some throughout Europe as well that um, if there is investment in social innovation that would also help to stem the tide of poverty and as well I'm just finishing now thank you to um, uh, to create employment for our youth. So just a question around if you know of or be willing to investigate the social innovation funding possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sapone. And Senator Barish, you have five minutes. Uh, welcome to uh, Deputy Costello. You're very welcome to this house. Uh, in fact, the first uh, person speaking in the series, um, Gay Mitchell MEP, said it, this is probably the closest uh, form of uh, European style interaction. Uh, compared to uh, the uh, 
the adversarial system that operates in the Dáil. So, so I hope you feel at home. Uh, people discuss the ideas here rather than call for resignations, and I certainly won't be doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, you. The numbers that you gave us were, 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 were really uh, graphic, uh, that 23.4% that, uh, unemployment of young people in Europe, and it's above 50, as you know, in Spain and uh, Greece. And so. And I think that's the first thing we have to uh, uh, take a look at. It seems to me that uh, a fixed exchange rate with Germany is going to cause massive youth unemployment in Spain, Greece, Portugal and Italy. Uh, now, I realise that to look at uh, the presence of those countries in the euro would involve loss of face for bankers and the bureaucracy and so on, but I must prefer that to loss of jobs. Uh, by people in general and by young people uh, in particular. And I think that policy uh, you know, may have to be uh, reassessed. I find it very difficult to see what can happen to Greece uh, with a fixed exchange rate with Germany, and young people will bear that burden to the tune of 50%. So. Uh, and I think probably, uh, as you know, if you assess the budget, the common agricultural policy has also got to be questioned. You mentioned food needs of people. Well, one of the purposes of the CAP is to keep food prices up. And uh, I derive no satisfaction seeing studies in the UK that large landowners and aristocrats are the major beneficiaries of the CAP. Why? Because they own more land uh, uh, than other people. And I could add to that that you know, in pursuing the goals that a lot of structural funds uh, uh, and, and maybe even some EIB money um, was spent that even with the grant included, it adds more to debt than to output uh, in the country. So that I think a, you know, a stricter assessment of what some of these proposals uh, actually accomplish in the end, uh, given the dire situation that all the, the countries were in, and this one uh, more spectacularly. I mean, those kind of pump priming projects work better when the debt to GDP ratio was 20 or 25, and not when it approaches 100, as it does in most countries. Your youth guarantee schemes, I think they're most interesting because we have, for one way or another, Another, impose that burden so he heavily uh, uh, on uh, on young people, and you mentioned uh, uh, the 27.7% uh, uh, youth unemployment uh, here. Um, that uh, you know, internships, I think, put in the the onus on employers, uh, you know, to, to create more internships, to bring people, young people in uh, from the margins uh, to experience work. Uh, the, uh, Kahirlik, uh, the, the acting Kahirlik has in his book, uh, a man who started a career by operating the trolleys in supermarkets. A job leads to a job. Unrequited or one-way social welfare payments don't lead to anything and build up dependency. And, and I think you know, looking at what is the goal in return for, we, we're not doing anybody any favours. You get this payment on condition that you don't do anything else. You know, go to play pool or something instead. But I mean, we must have something better to offer as, as a reciprocal uh, uh, benefit to the person uh, while retaining the cash payments because they, they have to uh, live as well. And a particular problem which Minister Burton has been drawing our attention to is that we developed in the, um, in the boom era a habit of putting people into disability and invalidity and therefore we've got more households with nobody in employment than anywhere else despite spending more on child benefit. So any of the reforms that can improve the lot of youth uh, by, by helping to live in houses where there's at least one worker uh, I think would, would be of immensely uh, uh, valuable to, uh, uh, to us. Uh, and uh, you know, anything, internships, the supermarket trolley man that the, that the Coherent mentions in, in, in his book, uh, they lead to something. Uh, and the dead end of welfare, the dead end of sickness and invalidity payments, I, mean, I think all of those have to be addressed. One other one that occurs to me in the, in the union that we're in, and I'll, I'll, I'll stand that, is uh, can we have some way of um, uh, tackling the language problem? If there, you know, uh, uh, Ireland suffers by being so unilingual, and I think that's actually increased. So, we're, um, economically, we're in the European Union. Linguistically, uh, we never joined. And I, I, should some schemes of assistance to Ireland from Germany and France include people from France and Germany going to Irish schools to help? Uh, improve uh, uh, the employability and the workability of the market. But 
I, it's most stimulating what you've been saying to us, and I wish you every good fortune uh, in it. And uh, we, we do need to, uh, to turn Europe, Europe around. You, you pointed out the targets to us, but the problem is, uh, since the banking crisis, we're going in the wrong direction. And, and sometimes I think I don't hear enough radicalism, not from you, but from Europe in general. Thank you very much. Hermine Margot, uh, Senator Catherine Riley. Two minutes. Senator Margot, um, I'd like to join my previous other senators and welcome um, Deputy Costa to the House. And I suppose it is apt that we are talking about employment and social inclusion um, this week um, in terms of the agreement that's just been reached at EFSCO in terms of the youth guarantee. And indeed, Eurostat released some interesting um, statistics earlier this week in terms of social inclusion. Um, the economic crisis, which has stripped away for a large part a lot of the social welfare rights of millions, is contributing to a widening poverty gap um, between the member states, the European Commission has said, and the worst affected are young people, unemployed women, single mothers in member states, predominantly located on the east and the south of the Union. And EU Employment Commissioner Laszlo Andor um, on, in Brussels on the 8th January said, most welfare systems have lost their ability to protect household incomes against the effects of the crisis. Indeed, um, Irish children and working age adults are more at risk of poverty or social inclusion than any other children in Western Europe, according to Eurostat data released earlier this week. And these figures show that Ireland's children are more likely to face social exclusion and financial poverty than their counterparts in 22 of the other 26 um, EU member states. And 38% of Irish under 18s are at most of risk of one of three forms of poverty or social inclusion. Um, either living in households with disposable income below 60% of the national median, being unable to pay bills on time, or living in households where adults have paid work for less than 20% of their available time. Now, when people among all age groups are taken into account, 29.9% of Irish people are at risk of poverty, well above the EU average of 24.2%. So I'd just like to ask, um, with such damning statistics, how, while holding the presidency, do we move towards social in Europe, inclusion in Europe when there is such rampant social exclusion in our own state? How can we move towards leading by example and trying to bring down such levels of poverty? Um, I know we are in, in, in a, a programme at the minute and there are cutbacks across um, all departments, but when we see such statistics and when we are holding the Irish presidency and when, there is, when social inclusion is so important, how do we actually try uh, and, and bridge the gap there? And obviously, I could make a contribution by talking about the youth guarantee. Uh, and as mentioned, the, the EFSCO conference today has agreed on the package. Um, and I suppose that this discourse, the timing of this, is, 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 is perfect, especially when we do look at, at the alarming figures of unemployment right across the EU. The headline figure of 11.7% unemployment across the Eurozone is, is bad enough, but I think it is important that we um, highlight that there has been a, a sharp increase in long term unemployment. Um, or long-term joblessness that is more concerning and that we need to address as a matter of urgency. And um, when you consider that 45% of the EU's unemployed have been out of work for more than a year, and in eight countries, that figure actually rises to um, over one in two. And in a foreword to the winter forecast, Marco Bucci, head of the Commission's Economics Department, said that um, acknowledged that the grave social consequences resulting from the unemployment crisis. Um, Indeed, the Commission paper itself conceded that long-term unemployment is associated with lower employability of job seekers and a lower sensitivity of the labour market to uh, economic upturns. So where do we go from here now? As I said, we have, there has been an announcement just um, before we come into the challenge here today on the Youth Guarantee Scheme. But where does that go? How do we go forward in terms of funding? There's, a lot, there's still a few questions to be answered. I know that... Time up. Okay, can I just very briefly just ask the question? Um, how do we make sure the, the guarantee is properly resourced um, in terms of will we have to match funding and how do we make sure that that's done? And how do we, I know that it guarantees um, positions of training and um, further education and, and internships, but how do we guarantee integration into the labour force after that? Because we don't want um, you know, cheap labour after this. We need sustainable jobs for young people that are socially and legally guaranteed um, as, as well as the minimum, minimum wage and, and education and training. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we've finished with the statements now from each party, and uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Deputy Costello. I believe the MEPs are called deputy as well. I only learned that recently. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, would you like to respond now to the statements you've heard? We will have one minute questions from the various uh, members after as well, or do you want to leave it all until the end? Which would you prefer? Maybe I'll leave it all until the leave end. Leave it all until the end. Okay, so I'll proceed into the questions. Proceed into the questions now. I have here before me. I have uh, Senator Colin Burke for a question. 
And uh, Senator Michael Mullins as well, whichever one you want to go first. Okay, I want to jo uh, join in the, in the welcome to uh, Deputy Costello, her, 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 um, her political experience and her, her, her achievements, I think, uh, go before her. They're well, well known, I think, by everybody who's been involved in politics in Ireland over the last number of years, and I certainly am aware of how successful she was as uh, Lord Mayor of Dublin and her, her, her many achievements. Uh, just uh, two, I suppose, two brief questions. Uh, you talked quite a bit about the uh, 2.5 billion European aid for the most deprived and you know, uh, rapporteur to that particular committee. Um, part of that fund is to address homeless, homelessness. Uh, and obviously, um, in our own country, we have, in, probably in most of our major towns and cities, uh, we have issues of, of homelessness. Do you see any opportunities for our own local authorities to be able to access some of that funding uh, to address the, 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 the issue of homelessness? And I think it's, it's quite uh, you know, depressing and distressing that we walk the streets of this capital uh, any morning and see the, the number of people that are sleeping in doorways. And, 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 and that happens in my own city of Galway as well. Uh, my second question um, and comment um, relates to the European Youth Guarantee, which will uh, provide uh, jobs or further education training or apprenticeships. You're probably aware recently that the, uh, the HSE and the Department uh, of Health had a scheme that would have given uh, employment opportunities to a thousand uh, nurses. Uh, yet uh, the uh, unions encouraged uh, those young people uh, not to take those positions because they felt the starting salaries weren't uh, of uh, sufficiently uh, high level. Do you think that the um, uh, European Youth Guarantee and what we're, we're, we're hoping to do there could run into difficulties uh, if we don't get buy-in from the, uh, the uh, various unions? And I suppose I'd like to know your own opinion of what, uh, on the advice that was given, which I feel myself was misguided. I think uh, we all have to lower expectations, and I think to get an employment opportunity, to get one foot onto the employment ladder, I think it was a, a missed opportunity for some people, and I think uh, they got bad advice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to let you know where we are, I have uh, Senator Ivana Batchik, Senator Aideen Hayden, uh, Colin Burke, and Susan O'Keefe for questions. So I call Senator Ivana Batchik. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And could I just welcome you very uh, warmly indeed to this House, uh, Deputy Costello, and just to say that we've soldiered together on many campaigns uh, over the years um, in different parts of Dublin. I think most recently in Sandy Mount on the on the most recent European Treaty referendum, where we did a very a very good canvas just towards the end of that campaign. So I just want to pay a real personal tribute to your real dedication, your hard work, your commitment to political change, your commitment to the Labour Party, and and to and to work to represent the people of Dublin at your European level. I just think you've done tremendous work. Um, I'm particularly uh, pleased to have you here today on the day that the European Youth Guarantee Agreement has been made and I think we've all just heard the good news on that and it really is wonderful news that at last we're going to have a commitment at EU level specifically to tackle these devastating figures on youth unemployment that we've heard about and that you've spoken about so eloquently. I had just one question for you and that is just from my reading about the Youth Guarantee and to see this very impressive figures on how it's worked, say in, for example in Finland where, this, where it's been quite well established. How does it work in practice and what are the very practical changes that young people here who are on the dole and who are currently just see no prospect of anything in this country for them and who are looking at emigration, how will it work practically to impact upon those young people? Thank you very much and you're very welcome again. Uh, thank you. And uh, Senator Fergal Quinn. Thank you. Uh, Deputy, you're very welcome. Delighted to have you in this house and thank you for saying those nice words about the house. We hope we're around next year, the following year and the following year for, to, to, to honour those indeed. I have, um, I have a couple of questions. One really is to do with safe food in Europe. Um, is there a danger, that particularly after what's happened with the discovery here in Ireland of the horse scandal, that, of the horse meat scandal, that the image that Europe has of creating safe food is being damaged and that we are now lagging behind other parts of the world? And may I tag on to that? the possibility of um, a free trade agreement with the United States, particularly because of the very heavy subsidies, the huge subsidies that farmers in Europe get from CAP. And the, the, the ban that we have in Europe on major American 
imports coming into, into, into Ireland. How can we manage to make sure that there is going to be a free trade agreement? Do you believe that that's likely to happen? The, the, the ban we have in, in Europe on that, uh, on, certainly on, on uh, beef um, coming in and also on certain uh, chicken products as well. It makes it, it seems to me, very difficult because we've been protecting ourselves on, on that basis. And one last question is to do really with the SMEs and the less late payment directive from the European Union. Um, I believe, and, and this is the voice of the SMEs say, that they believe that this late payment directive is going to damage the Irish situation. We have the latest payments in Europe. It takes 66 days to get paid. The new directive says you should pay within 30 days, but not later than 60. Now, when you say not later than 60, that actually means 60 days, because anybody who's paying and says you're okay for 60 days, that's what will happen. Do you believe that EU legislation such as this is actually adding to the cost of operating businesses here in, in Europe? Thank you. It's interesting. Hayden. Thank you very much, Lasker Herlock. I'd also like to welcome Deputy Costello to the House and say that we're, you know, we're living in very different times. I mean, I can remember a time when people used to talk about going over to Europe. And now, I mean, here we have a member of the European Parliament sitting in front of the Shannon Chamber. And I hope the, the door will take a, a leaf out of our book. <clears throat> but it is good to see uh, that greater engagement with the European Parliament in particular. Um, I suppose my question is somewhat philosophical, really. I mean, I absolutely, completely agree with you that we need to move much more rapidly towards a social Europe. I think it, it's very important for a number of reasons, not least in terms of the overall competitiveness of the European Union. I mean, we have a number of very different welfare models within Europe. Um, I mean, just, you know, in relation to, say, Northern Europe, we have the social democratic model, we have the residual model between, you know, in Ireland in the UK, we have the Southern European model in the Southern European countries, and in the Eastern European countries we have an even different model of social welfare and overall welfare provision. And I'm wondering, in your view, if we do move towards a more cohesive social Europe, will that Europe work more towards a baseline of social supports, you know, along the line of the project that you're engaged in, the feed project, where it, it's very much uh, support for the most needy within society? Or do you see scope, like in, in the context like environmental policy, uh, where we move towards more consistency of supports between European nations, which I do think is important when you look at overall competitiveness, because in a way like environmental policy, if one country offers only very minimal supports and other countries offer uh, much more gilt edge supports, it does have an impact on the type of economy that comes out the other side. Thank you. And Senator Colin Burke. Um, could I just touch on a totally different issue, um, and that's in relation to, I understand your involvement in relation to the Palestinian issue in the European Parliament, uh, and as someone who has visited Gaza, and I've raised this on a number of occasions already uh, previously, uh, at, at what stage are we within Europe in relation to the whole issue of trying to get a solution um, and the European Union being more proactive in trying to get a solution to the problem uh, between the Israel and Palestinian uh, community. And in particular, the whole issue, and I have a very big issue about the sale of arms and equipment from EU states um, to Israel. Um, and indeed, uh, I'm sure it's happening to other uh, countries who may be indirectly involved in the conflict there as well. I'm just wondering what progress has been made as regards trying to deal with that issue and stand up to, uh, you know, while there's a continuous supply of arms and equipment, then we're not going to make any progress in bringing out about a solution. And it is 1.5 million people uh, locked into a very small area land with no progress made in 15, 20 years at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. And the final question I have from Senator Susan O'Keefe. Thank you, Lasker Herlock. And again, um, Deputy Costello, you're very welcome indeed. Uh, I think <coughs> many people in this House, particularly uh, Senator Burke, and to a lesser extent myself, have been always calling that this House would have a closer alignment with, with, with Europe and the European Parliament and the activities of Europe. We have sort of not succeeded um, with the legislative side, but certainly to have you and your fellow MEPs here, uh, I think is most welcome because it does say we are trying to reach out and we're trying to bring the affairs of the European Parliament closer to home and for people to understand better and I think that your speech uh, talking about um, the social pact 
was most welcome indeed. And so what I'd like to ask, if I might, is, um, is it possible to embed it, as you described it, uh, just from a European level? How, how do you reach out and get support from, from national governments? Because it's never going to come just uh, from, from a European Parliament standpoint, important though that is, of course. And then particularly in relation to the Youth Guarantee, you talked about the, the, the potential for pilot projects quite soon. And I wondered if you had your eye on certain projects or if you had certain projects that you believe would work to prove that the Youth Guarantee is something real and not just a, a banner for politicians to fly to say, look what we've done, isn't that great? Look, there's a Youth Guarantee and it actually doesn't do anything. So I, I feel sure that given your own passion for this, that there are probably projects that you have earmarked or in your head think would be a good model uh, to prove its, its, uh, its impact, its potential impact. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed and thank you to all the uh, questioners and uh, Deputy. Uh, if I could ask you to respond, you have plenty and a wide portfolio there, even wider than your own brief, so you have to be an expert on everything when you come in here, Deputy. Thank you very much indeed and appreciate what you're doing. Thank you, Laska Herlock, and uh, thank you very much for all of your comments and your questions. Uh, indeed, I found uh, the, the comments and the questions and the debate here this morning really stimulating and really interesting and just uh, reflecting on various different aspects of my work. So I'll try and, and go, go through the answers and uh, where, where I can answer, I will. Where I can't answer, I will try and come back to some of the senators with additional information. Um, first of all, uh, to Senator Layden, uh, I might just tr I'll try and take people in the order in which they spoke, but there may be some crossover with some of the issues that people have raised. Uh, Senator Layden and uh, Senator Burke raised the whole issue around Palestine. And first of all, to say that I am very aware that the Senate has had a particularly strong tradition in monitoring what's happening uh, in the Middle East. And uh, indeed, Senator McLanagan, uh, when, I was in, um, when I was in the West Bank there recently, uh, there were a number of people from FATA asking me about Senator McLanagan and remembering him very fondly. So that was, uh, that, that was quite a good experience uh, to have. And I'd certainly welcome the opportunity, Senator Layden, of meeting with Friends of Palestine and updating them, them on the events. I think the situation in Palestine is very, very serious. Like, I am fully supportive of the uh, concept of a two-state solution, uh, that Israel should be allowed to live freely within, securely within its borders. There is no doubt about that, but like, equally that the Palestinian state has the right to self-determination and that Palestinians have the right to statehood as was recently endorsed by the uh, vote at the UN where they received uh, non-member state, uh, no, uh, mem uh, state observer status. Um, so that was something, and that was a hugely important vote. Only one European country uh, actually opposed that in the end, which was the Czech Republic. And that was uh, that was something that was actually quite interesting as well. That you know that uh, uh, that that Europe did actually facilitate that, and that is the, the, the start of the recognition of Palestinian statehood. But there is a huge body of work to be done on that, and I certainly believe that the window of opportunity for this, the, the two-state solution is narrowing all the time. The Israelis, uh, as we are are aware have uh, retaliated with the idea of expanding the settlements and uh, in the area of E1 just outside Jerusalem and I've been there and I've seen the settlements and um, I've seen Malia de Dumin and uh, th the idea that th they would uh, expand the settlement there E1 will effectively divide the West Bank in half and it will mean that a contiguous a Palestinian state will not be possible and like that is um, that will be the upshot of uh, the expansion of the settlements so I think it's something that we have to monitor and indeed I have been briefing the Tornishta on, um, on, on, on that issue. Uh, uh, the new Israeli government, we still have to see exactly how that, uh, how, how that evolves. The government hasn't been finally formed yet. Um, the Israelis themselves, and I think that we can see it from the, the results of the Israeli elections, that I think the Israelis voted on many different issues. There are many social issues and there are many issues facing the Israelis, and not all of the Israelis are preoccupied with the Palestinian conflict either. And I think that it's important that we appreciate that. And indeed, I was in Israel in October and I met with many of the uh, civil society organisations and we discussed issues other than the Palestinian conflict um, with them. And I think it's important to be conscious of them, um, to be conscious of that as well. Uh, it's, it, it's an area that we could, um, we could spend a long time talking about. I believe, as other speakers have said, that the EU must 
not just be a payer, we're the largest single donor to the, um, to, to, to the Middle East and to Palestine. So if we are going to be a payer, we have to be a player. Uh, and I don't believe that we are actually achieving our true potential. And I have raised this issue with Baroness Cathy Ashton, who's the High Representative in the Euro European Parliament, on numerous occasions. And I'd be happy to send you the uh, scripts of the, the speeches that I've made and what I have said to Baroness Ashton in that regard as well. But I do believe that there is a strong role. Uh, I understand that there is going to be a new um, that there is going to be a new initiative, uh, and uh, I know that Baroness Ashton is actually quite committed. And we have to to accept as well that Europe is in a very difficult position and Baroness Ashton is in a very difficult position because we talk about uh, Europe speaking with one voice but we are 27, soon to be 28 member states and we don't speak with a unified voice on the Middle East issue and that's one of the, uh, that's one of the areas that's, that, that's a cause for concern and I think that sometimes when she is criticised it's she can't actually sometimes articulate a, a, a view because she doesn't have a unified approach coming from the member state governments and that's something that we have to take on board as well when we look at the response of the EU to the issue. So there are many complexities and I would really welcome the opportunity to, as I say, discuss it with you or maybe discuss it with, uh, with some of your committees. Um, and then just uh, moving on to the um, moving on then to the uh, just EU 2020 strategy and the youth guarantee. There have been a number of questions in relation to the youth guarantee. The first thing that I would say is, is that the youth guarantee there's, uh, is um, it's not a cure all. It's not going to end youth unemployment, and we're not pretending that it will. But we are saying that there is a crisis in Europe. That we've almost 24% across Europe. That some countries are facing 50 to 60% of youth unemployment, and that it's hugely crucial that we actually deal with the uh, that we deal with the issue we have seen the experience in countries that implement a youth guarantee that they have low levels of, uh, of, of of youth unemployment and so we believe that there is an opportunity at european level to introduce a project that would actually take this on board there is six billion set aside for youth uh, opportunities youth employment initiatives in the mff in the parliament again we believe that it it, it should be more but uh, we will take that there's three billion coming from the social fund and there's Three, there'll, there'll be three billion new money, uh, and we believe that uh, we believe that it should be more. But I do believe, and a few, a few people have mentioned Jobbridge, and uh, that, that, that the experience of Jobbridge has been very has, has been very positive. And I know that there is some concern around Jobbridge as well, or uh, around internship programmes. And one of the issues that we are looking for in the European Parliament is is that the youth guarantee is one side of it, and on the other side, then we would have a quality framework for internships and traineeships, and that would ensure that traineeships and interns would not be subject to abuse. Um and that there would be proper monitoring put in place there. And I actually believe that Jobbridge is actually quite a good model that maybe other countries could follow. And we have seen from Jobbridge that 60% of the people who participate in Jobbridge actually move on to employment. And that's, that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's really, really significant. But I do believe that we do need a, a quality framework. I was at a conference in the European Parliament um, on youth unemployment not so long ago. And we had a room full of 400 young people. And they were asked, um, the moderator said, how many young people here have done one internship? 99% of the room put their hand up. How many have done two? 95% put their hand up. Three, four, five internships, there's still over half the room putting their hand up. That's not acceptable that we have that level um, of, of internships. And I have to say that sometimes my own institution, the European Parliament, makes great use of, of, of interns, but very often unpaid interns, and that's not acceptable either. And I believe that in the European Parliament, we need to, to make sure that we, 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 we have our own guidelines and our own code in relation, to, uh, in, in, in relation to that. So I do think that the youth guarantee it is, it's, it, it's, it's one piece in the jigsaw, and I very much welcome it. It's just, it, it, it's, uh, I, I feel it's sort of really fortuitous to be here today on the day that the youth guarantee is actually announced and is coming to fruition. Uh, and I agree with Senator Riley when she says that, um, you know, we need to have jobs for these young people, like that uh, we can train them up, we can skill them. But where are they going to go when they finish these apprenticeships and when they finish, uh, when, when, when they finish their training? places because we still have to be able to move them on out of out, out of training out of internships into jobs and that's where I believe that we actually need 
to achieve sustainable growth in the European economy. And that's why I believe that the European budget should not be seen as some kind of measure of expenditure that countries are fighting each other and they're saying that they're not putting into the European budget, that they should actually see that contributing to the European budget is an investment. It's an investment for growth. It's not an expenditure item. And I think that we really need to hammer home that message. And that's why the European Parliament is actually very concerned about the budget that is before us at the moment. And we know that, it was, it, 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 that there were a lot of negotiations we understand that, uh, that the negotiations that were concluded on the 8th of February were felt that, it, that they were the best deal that could be achieved. But we in the European Parliament have major reservations about both the amounts that are in the uh, MFF and also in relation to some of the content and how the MFF is to be structured and delivered over the coming seven years. And we will be engaging, and we have given our group leader, Hannes Wadaba, um, a mandate to go off and negotiate on, um, on, on, on our behalf. Um, Senator Clune um, mentioned the Jobs Committee here, and I would just maybe say as, as well that we um, that we had a meeting with the uh, Employment and Social Affairs Committee uh, in Dublin uh, in early February, and we actually met with some of the members of the committee, and indeed we met with uh, some of the areas uh, just to, to uh, on, on Senator Batchik's and other qu questions about the uh, about the youth guarantee and how it would be implemented or where it could be implemented, and indeed the Employment and Social Affairs Committee went out and they met with uh, representatives from Ballymun uh, and. And um, they had a look at how Ballymun, and Bally, we met with Ballymun Job Centre, and it was hugely impressive, the work that is going on in Ballymun, how they are actually working in terms of uh, regeneration, uh, community, uh, in, in involving people from the community at all levels of life. And this is the really interesting, uh, the, 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 the approach that's taken in Ballymun is, is that it's a life cycle approach. So from the time uh, the, the woman announces that she's pregnant, she's taken on board by the various different services. There's a whole integrated approach so that when the baby is born, she's got the supports there. As the baby progresses through childcare, preschool, into school, there's a whole integrated approach. After school is looked after, healthcare is looked after, uh, and then as the young person develops and evolves, youth activities are all integrated into the approach of, of Young Ballymun. And I have to say, I was hugely impressed with what is happening with Young Ballymun. And then tied into that, you have Ballymun Job Centre, which is actually providing support to people who are looking for work. And I think that I can say that uh, the, the, the whole committee were hugely impressed with what they saw. Similarly, we went and visited the Digital Skills Academy and we saw the um, the kind of activities that are going on there as well. And we know that uh, many of the jobs that will be created in the future can be in the area of um of uh, new media, uh, internet technology, etc. And indeed, I'm hosting a conference uh, and an exhibition in the European Parliament next Tuesday, which will be opened by uh, uh, Commissioner Maura Gagan Quinn, the Commissioner for Research and Innovation, on showing and showcasing Dublin as a smart, innovative, creative and connected city. And we have Dublin City Council coming out and they're bringing out Intel and they're bringing out the Ryan Academy and they're bringing out DCU and TCD. And there are just so many different organisations organizations, Intel, IBM, Smart Cities, uh, they're, they're, they're all coming to say what a wonderful creative city Dublin was. And some of you have referred to the fact that when I was Lord Mayor, this is one of the areas that I prioritised, Dublin as a creative, innovative, outward and forward looking city. Um, I just also may, might mention, Senator, as well, that I did make a submission to your, to, to your Jobs Committee and we did look at the, uh, at the, at, at the um, Youth Guarantee as well. And I very much welcome the work that your committee and the support that we have received from the members of your committee on that. Particularly, I know that Senator John Lyons has been very, very active on that, um, on that issue. Um, and just uh, moving on, as, as Senator Quinn mentioned the, the issue around food and uh, the, issue of, uh, the issue of safe food and are we, are, are we tarnished. Uh, Senator Quinn, I suppose it was with, uh, 
we were a bit um, look, looking at the situation that was, is unfolding in Europe, um, a bit awry, I suppose, in the European Parliament, because I, I, I understand that two years ago, the European Parliament came up with proposals in relation to food labelling and indeed to dealing with origin of uh, goods, particularly where there are mixed goods coming in, and the Council would not agree to what we were proposing. And now we find ourselves, so in a sense, I suppose the European Parliament is not taking any pleasure, but is saying, you know, we said that this could be, um, we, 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 we did indicate that this could be an issue. Um, Senator Morn asked a number of difficult questions um, in uh, relation, as is her want, um, <laughs> and uh, in relation to um, in, in relation to the food um, program. Yes, we are engaging very much with NGOs. Uh, the, the feed program. Um, we are engaging very much with NGOs. I did have the seminar here in the European Parliament uh, on the 8th of February, and we had about 100 NGOs involved. Uh, with about 100 people attending many of whom are NGOs. I engaged widely with NGOs at European level, I engaged at national level, and I met uh, with German, French, Belgian national, um, national NGOs as well. Many of the amendments that I submitted were taking on board the issues that they had actually brought to my attention. The way that the, um, the, the, way that the, uh, that, that the um, report will progress now through the European Parliament is, is that uh, I will be looking at the amendments, trying to see in some cases can we put some compromise amendments together where amend uh, and uh, bring it to committee. Uh, amendments will be considered in March. We will look at compromise amendments then uh, and see how we, how, how we can get on with working with the shadows and the other groups. The European Parliament is a wonderful place actually because it's not adversarial. It's a bit like the Senate here as well. Um, it's not adversarial. We work in committee. We work with each other. Not all um, the time. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, um, in, like in fact, Senator, our uh, MEP Marion Harkin is actually my shadow on the feed um, on, the, on, on, on the feed report, and so we work together in cooperation with each other. Uh, we put forward amendments, and then we will be taking it to council. One of the issues, actually, and thank you, Senator, for reminding me, because one of the issues that I did raise in, 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 my, in my own report is, is that there was a requirement for co-funding for feed that there should be 85% um, funding and then 15% co-funding, and my report report is actually proposing that we withdraw the requirement for, for, um, for co-funding on the basis already that the charities who are involved in this programme leverage so much additional funding themselves from the work that they do. And they do, um, a, they're able to target various different areas and I've been to, um, like I, I visited Crosscare and the, um, the food bank that they have, I've met with Healthy, Healthy Living for All and indeed Duncan Stewart on EcoEye did a whole programme on food waste and uh, I, I see very much that this, this, this programme that we're involved in would tie in with many of the policies on, um, on, on food waste. So there's, there's a huge amount that can actually be achieved there. But we're not out of the woods because there is still a blocking minority in relation to this programme. And I believe, and it goes back then to the idea about the social pact and what we're talking about the social pact and how would that work and some of Kath, uh, uh, Senator Zappone's and Senator Hayden's question. The kind of Europe that I believe in is a Europe that is socially cohesive. Uh, while I, the, the single market is not an end in itself, the single market is there to serve the people of the European Union. And we cannot have a truly proper single market unless we have social cohesion. So I've I've uh, been debating this in the Parliament with m members from other member states as well who don't believe, say, that it's the business of the European Union to be giving food aid to European citizens. Well, I'm sorry, I don't believe that. I believe that we have to reach out to the, most, uh, to, to, to the people who are on the margins. But it's not just a question of giving out charity. And that's the problem that we had with the MDP when it was just intervention stocks. And indeed, I know people who were grossly insulted with getting cheese stamped, sort of donated by the European Union. And it, just, and it was horrible. And I met organisations that said, how can we give these food parcels to people and their children open the fridge and they see that they're on intervention? and cheese and it's terrible um, and so what we're looking at now for this um, what we're looking now with this program is that this would be a socially inclusive so uh, a model that we would follow so not just 
do we give the food aid, but that we use it as a way of bringing people in, taking and ensuring that there are social inclusion measures, so ensuring then that maybe they're able to meet the next rung on the ladder by participating in maybe ESF job incentive programmes, because the ESF will not look after them at this stage. How am I doing time-wise, can you ask her look? You're doing grand, uh, um, your husband is waiting in the wings. So, uh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, so, so I suppose like, the, 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 the FEED programme to me is fundamental to what the European Union is about when we talk about social cohesion. I think that this is, um, that this is where we're at. Uh, one, um, uh, Senator, I, uh, raised, I think it was Senator Barrett raised the issue around, you know, well, can we actually have a common currency and can, is, 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 is the currency sustainable and, you know, should Greece be at the same level as, as Germany? Well, I, I, I've just, I would say to you, Senator, that I don't agree with that premise and I don't believe that if you cut Greece free from the euro, that you are somehow going to save Greece from, from any more of the problems than are being experienced by Greece. And I believe that the best thing that we can do is show solidarity with Greece, ensure, as we have done to date, that we pull out all the stops to ensure that Greece stays within the Eurozone and that we work to support Greece from within the European Union, but that we do not cast Greece or other countries who experience difficulties out, because that is not what European solidarity is about. Uh, and uh, your position is the one that is advocated by my colleague Nigel Farage in the European Parliament and I have to say that I really do take major issue with what Mr Farage has to say on that. So I, I, just, I, I, I don't believe that, it's, um, that you're starting at the right place. I think that w what w Greece is facing serious problems and indeed Greece is going up to almost 60% uh, youth unemployment, like, and I know that uh, we're like we're facing really serious, um, we're, we're, we're face, facing really serious economic issues. But the stories that you hear from Greece are just absolutely heartbreaking. When I when I discuss the the situation in Greece and Spain and Portugal with my colleagues, can I tell you a story about what one of my colleagues from Portugal told me? That there was an opinion poll done. Portugal, remember, is, emerge, is, is, is a new and emerging democracy that has, within living memory, come out of dictatorship. There was an opinion poll done in Portugal recently. People said that they weren't disillusioned with politics or with their politicians, even though they were, uh, or with their parliaments. What they were really most disillusioned with was democracy. The army were saying, this isn't what we overthrew the generals for. Um, like that is, th th that's a really, really serious situation when democracy itself is being undermined. And that's why I believe that Europe has to be seen as part of the solution. And the European Union can only do that by showing solidarity and by promoting social cohesion. And we can only do that by developing the kind of ideas that I've been talking to you about here today. We have various different programmes. We have the structural funds, we have the, we have the cohesion funds, we have the structural funds, we have the ESF, um, we have now the, the, the aid for the most deprived. But we have to have a social agenda on top of that. And we've been, and the, the, the European Union has been, uh, and I do believe that it's right, that we need financial rules and we need, to, we need to work within a stable economic framework. But we also need to make sure that we do work within the, the whole framework of social cohesion, of social solidarity, and that we, we cannot advance the single market unless we have a le level playing field for all. Ireland has benefited greatly from many of these programmes in the past, and I believe that we can continue to play, um, that we can continue to play a role in doing that. Um, Senator Riley said, well, like, look at our figures and how can we hold ourselves up as an example of good practice and hold the presidency? The one thing that I would say is, is that, uh, and Senator Leiden will, I think, bear this out because we did meet them. Um, we had a very interesting interparliamentary discussion on the European semester there about two or three weeks ago. And there was a really, really good interaction between national parliaments and the European Parliament. And that's how it should be. 
uh, and it was it was it was really really excellent um, the interaction and the debates that we had between the national parliaments and the European Parliament on the future um, on, on, on the future of Europe. There are huge and very high expectations from the Irish presidency, and so far the Irish presidency has gained a reputation for being efficient, for being businesslike, and for getting the job done. Uh, and there are huge expectations with the number of dossiers that are on the table that we will actually be able to, to deliver those dossiers and there is a feeling that we're heading in now to a period of, because once we come to June 2013, we'll be coming to June 2014 and then we will... Um, We'll be coming to, to June 2014, we're into new European elections and a new European Commission. So it's important that before, the, before we go into the last year that we do actually get the job done. I think as parliamentarians you, 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 want, you understand how that, um, how that, actually, uh, how that actually works. Um, so that is, uh, that's, that, that, that's where we're heading um, in relation to the, the Irish presidency. But there is, the Irish presidency is actually, uh, I think, taking a leading role. And Senator Quinn asked about um, trade with the US. I know that uh, I met with Minister Bruton and he said that the free trade agreement with the US is one of his key priorities over this period. Uh, and I'm, but I know that there are a lot of negotiations to be done in relation to that and the European Parliament will play, a very, uh, will, will, will play a very strong role in the oversight of any free trade agreements that are arranged with any countries as, as, as we do. Um, there, are a few other, um, there are a few other issues. Just yes, um, it was mentioned too um, in relation to the developing, um, the developing world, and could we have a, a, sort of some kind of a, 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 a humanitarian core that would actually work overseas? Um, just uh, a few weeks ago, the Employment and Social Affairs Committee was delivering an opinion on the proposal to have a humanitarian aid core from the European Union, and I can send you the report on that, Senator so I will come back to you on that. Senator Quinn asked about the late payments directive and did I believe that that would actually be, um, would, would that actually impact neg negatively on Irish business. My experience is, is that SMEs in Ireland are equally looking for the late payments directive to apply. The late payments directive will just actually apply a penalty or interest on, a, on, on, on companies who don't pay on time. And I think it is important that in these straitened times with struggling SMEs that they do actually get their money. So m many of the representations that I have received are for the early implementation of the Late Payments Directive. So I'll investigate whether or not there, is, um, there are other issues there. As I said, that, that the, and the, the, other, uh, the other point just to, to make again is, is that with the European Investment Bank, like we had a, a, a discussion last week on SMEs and the extra 10 billion that is coming from the um, European Investment Bank. And I strongly believe that the European Investment Bank should actually be making money available and there will be a programme from 2014 where the Investment Bank will be making uh, money available to SMEs and that's something that's, uh, th that is important. In relation to the language barrier, um, th that's an issue that's probably close to my heart because I worked for 10 years in Largus, um, which manages a lot of the EU funded programmes in education and I was responsible for sending uh, students on and, and, and developing projects projects with schools, a uh, lingua projects with schools, language projects, communities language projects, and send, d d sending language assistance abroad and bringing language assistance to Ireland. And it was, um, it was a hugely rewarding um, programme and uh, many of the schools and the teachers who were involved in it uh, found it u very useful. There are a good few linguists in Ireland. It is surprising and you do find them. The problem is, is that Eng like, you know, it's, English is the lingua franca in so many ways and very often you go to meetings and even if there's no translation everybody just has to speak English. You try, like I, I, I speak French and it is an advantage to have French but even I find it can, can be sometimes quite difficult to do a conversation, uh, to have a conversation in French because people would prefer to speak English to you and sometimes you have to, um, you have to work with that but I did actually find that the language was actually very useful in my negotiations with many of the NGOs. I visited a number of the French NG, NG, NGOs Grestos de Care was one of them, I visited them in Strasbourg and I was able to talk directly to a lot of people because
because I had um, because I had the language, and I would be aware of the fact that languages are important, and I would be very much supporting. And that's why, as well, I would be very much supporting Erasmus for all, or whatever it's called. I'm not that dying about the name, but whatever the the new Erasmus um, program is, is 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 going to be called, um, I would be very much supportive of that, and I would feel that we need to have a, a budget that is fit for purpose for that as well. And I would hate to see a situation that we ran into this year where we ran out of money and we had to, to uh, we, we had to um, leave national agencies and students without money and without payments uh, un until we got the situation resolved. And I was very d glad to see that the European Parliament played a very strong role in resolving uh, those issues that we had with, with, with Erasmus earlier on this year. I think I've covered most of the areas that people have um, that people have asked. I'm sorry, I kind of just went went around a bit and, and, and took it thematically. Um, just I think Senator Zappon again asked about the um, the social pact and can we actually ensure that that would be uh, would, would be socially binding? I believe that we have to make sure that we put the same rules in place in terms of social legislation as we do with economic legislation. And I just very much welcome the fact that the that that the social investment pact that Commissioner Andor launched last week, I believe is the start of that process and I would hope that the Council by June could actually come up and develop a process. I'll just finish off um, here look, on just the final question, one that is dear to my heart about the reduction in the number of seats. Um, there is a uh, a proposal, as you know, on the table that we have to that, that Ireland will lose one seat uh, for the next European elections. And while it is as a result of Croatia joining, it is also as a result of the Treaty of Lisbon, because we the Treaty of Lisbon says that we can only have 751 seats in the European Parliament. Um, 